How do you put into words and tell the story to describe a remarkable transition of kids who have never had enough to eat, who come from an orphanage, maybe have been trafficked, come from an HIV environment, we have kids from a leprosy village. How do you capture in words the remarkable and dignified transformation and transition that those kids within a couple of years are making in starting their careers at international five-star hotels and resorts? Not just a job, but a life with dignity and choice and self-sufficiency. That's the story of streets. And that's the story I'd like to share with you a little bit today. Streets is a very ambitious 18-month hospitality and culinary training program for terribly, terribly poor kids. It's also a business-oriented social enterprise, not a conventional charity. We support ourselves in large part through the revenue of our restaurant and related businesses. I don't know how many of you here are uh, connected to or aware of uh, social enterprises. I want to say a word about social enterprises, and perhaps what social enterprises are not. <laughs> social enterprises are not organizations that have good employment practices. Social enterprises are not merely organizations that are environmentally sensitive. Social enterprises are not places where men and women, of course, are treated equally. Social enterprises are not coffee houses that trade in good quality, fair trade coffee. Social enterprises are not organizations that give five or 10 or 12% of their revenue back to their community. All of those things are what any good, decent, modern business practice includes. Social enterprises as all those things and more. Legitimate social enterprises are all those things and more. Social enterprises take all of their revenue, not part, all of their revenue goes back into the mission, speaking of mission, the mission of the organization to ameliorate or deal with any one of the many pressing social, ecological, environmental, political, social issues that we're faced with. I think it's important in this day and age where social enterprises are so current to our thinking and our possibilities that we differentiate between what a legitimate social enterprise is as opposed to a business with good business practices. At Streets, we're driven by a few basic, as you said, simple but powerful, few basic principles. One, we had some incredibly beautiful and touching experience with this yesterday and today. No matter, one's, no matter what one's past, it certainly does not limit one's future. No matter what one's past, it doesn't limit one's future. When we ask and expect a lot from ourselves and from others, we get a lot. When we ask a lot, we get a lot. That we are all equal. Indeed, we are all equal, especially men and women, really equal. And that life should be full of dignity and choices, not just a job. Our kids come from all over Hoi An, uh, excuse me, all over Vietnam, and we're situated in Hoi An. For those of you that don't know Vietnam very well, Hoi An is a beautiful, lovely UNESCO World Heritage 18th century seaport in the center of the country. Come and visit us, but make sure you have reservations at our restaurant or I may not be able to get you in. It's a lovely, lovely place, and it's a very uh, popular tourist destination for people that are visiting uh, Vietnam. Our kids are all poor, terribly, terribly poor kids. A type of poverty, it's difficult to imagine sitting here in this beautiful hotel in Berlin. For 18 months, we house them. For many of our kids, it's the first time in their life they've had a safe, clean place to sleep. We have supervo supervised dormitory housing, a boy's house and a girl's house. We provide all the clothing, food. For most of our kids, it's the first time in their lives. We're talking about kids 16 to 22 years old. In, uh, in Germany and the states where I come from, of course, to talk to an adolescent or a young person and say you're a kid at 17 or 18 or 19 or 20 would be uh, uh, at the least politically un incorrect. But in Vietnamese, in the language from which I am, I am a student, <laughs> um, you're a kid until you are uh, married. 
essentially. So we refer to our kids in Vietnamese correctly as kids, and uh, I think that carries over into my um, English uh, thinking at this point in terms of them. So we have a boy's house and a girl's house. We provide all clothing, all food. For most of our kids who put on 15 to 20 kilos in the first two months they're with us, it's the first time in their life that they've had three meals a day. Many of them have had only one meal, if they're lucky, all their life. Kids who are 18, 19, and 20 years old. We provide basic medical, dental, and eye care, and everything else that you need to live in a dignified way. Every nine months, we start another group of about 20 kids. That way, we always have an advanced group and a beginning group. Remember, it's an 18-month program. In the beginning, we talk to anybody that would listen. I still talk almost to anybody that will listen. We talk to Buddhist priests and Catholic nuns. We talk to the police, the government, NGOs. I have visited more orphanages that um, would be fair to ask anybody to ever have to visit. We talk to hotels and community leaders, anyone. Now when we start a new class, we send out an announcement. We send it out in many, many different ways, not just the internet. Not every poor person has access to the internet. But anyway, we send out an, an announcement. We let it be known that we're starting another class, and we take applications. We just started our eighth class. We took 26 kids. We had over 125 applications. I often say that's the one job that I would like to give away. We have a training center with classrooms, the same as we all know classrooms in the Western world. We have a small teaching kitchen. We have a 16-station computer language lab. Our kids, many of them, have never been to high school. Our average kid in our program has finished sixth grade. In Vietnam, although there is a reasonably decent public education system, there's still a small monthly fee. Poor families don't have that small monthly fee, and kids are forced to drop out of school for that reason. So we have a 16-station computer language lab. We teach culinary, international cooking, all the mother sauces. For those of you who are culinary people, I also don't like the word foodie, so I'm going to painfully resist it. We teach knife skills and sanitation and food science, the same as if you went to culinary school here in Berlin or Melbourne or London or New York. We teach hospitality and guest service, a la carte service, banquet service, set menu, bar and beverage, coffee making, hosting, and all the very many important things that go with that. International standards of food safety, sanitation, personal hygiene are high on our list. Several months ago, those of you that have been in Vietnam will see that this is not being a big, big award, but the government awarded us at our apprentice restaurant, which I'll mention in a moment, uh, the award for the cleanest kitchen in the center of Vietnam. Now, I've been in the restaurant a long time, and my kitchens are always very, very clean. But um, we ensure that uh, we have such standards because of the um, training and the preparation that we're giving to our kids for these remarkable careers. We're changing lives of kids the way no one else is, I have to say um, modestly, and the credit going to the kids, not, not, not to us. We teach English language, not because it's my language, and I'm, as you can probably tell, an American and, and suffer from all the handicaps of learning other languages that unfortunately many Americans also suffer from. But we teach English language because I think it's fair to say it is the language, the international language of tourism and hospitality. And one's career in, in an international setting is largely in part tied to the ability to speak and communicate and comprehend and understand English. Remember, we're talking about kids, some of whom have had no school. The average has had maybe sixth grade, speaks Vietnamese, not a word of English when we meet them. We have three full-time English teachers, and I said a 16-station computer language lab. Nobody thinks about using the technology that you and I and our kids use for poor kids, but we do, and it works. We teach life skills. Life skills, um, all those things that those of us that were lucky enough to have a mother and a father, and perhaps really lucky in both, and a grandmother and a grandfather, all those wonderful lessons and all those things that we learned, and some of us to have our mothers here to be with us today, how lucky you are. All those things from what's a boy and a girl like, and what, how do men and women get 
get along with one another and what's sex about and physiology and alcohol and drugs and how do we uh, act individually responsible and socially responsible. All our kids get an ATM card and a small monthly allowance because if you've been in survival mode your whole life, you don't know about savings. And on and on and on for our life skills program. But perhaps most important, perhaps most important, I've alluded to it, we have apprenticing in our streets restaurant cafe on Leloy Street. And please, as I said, come and visit us, but make reservations. 4.30 most afternoons during the busy season, we're booked solid for the evening. After a short orientation period, all our trainees, that's what we call program participants, all of our trainees select to either study an apprentice in the back of the house, for those of you know the back of the house, to become a professional cook, or in the front of the house to become a professional hospitality server, bartender, etc. They all must pick one or the other for their classroom experience and their apprenticing. But we have a very heavy hand in that selection process. The main reason is that all the boys want to be cooks and all the girls want to be servers. And one of the important lessons we're teaching is gender equality. And our kids, probably like kids everywhere, but certainly like kids who have not been exposed or traveled, really don't know what's a professional server. They don't know that there's a good chance, I don't know, the GM at this hotel may have started out as a server, right? We know from our or as a cook, but they certainly don't know that there's this whole front of house and all the great possibilities to be an F&B manager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a heavy hand in that selection, largely to keep our gender equality in each one of our class between boys and between girls. As you may be thinking, um, it's not an easy program. One of the jokes early on when we started the program um, people would say, as our guests would come into the restaurant and they have this great opportunity to talk to our kids, they would say, as I walked away, I'm not there as much as I was in the beginning, of course. We all know about what an opening is like and how our role changes as we grow and develop and expand. They would say, what's he like? And they would look around to see if I was listening. And they would say, he's a very, very difficult man. It's become kind of a joke, as you can imagine and maybe get, but... Um, they know that that difficulty came from respect and from love and from understanding, perhaps more than others, what the possibility is for a poor, often perhaps trafficked street kid. They still say he's a very difficult man, but now it's open. So what's a typical difficult day like under a difficult man? 6 a.m., This is we have a boys' house and a girls' house. All our, We have six buildings, all our... Um, our, our site selection, other than the restaurant, which of course was, had to do with tourist traffic and all of that, all of our other buildings um, are within 10 minutes by bicycle. All of our kids get a bicycle. It's the first thing any of them have ever owned of importance in their entire life. And they learn a lot from a bicycle because when the bicycle breaks, they have to walk. That's a lesson most of us were lucky enough to have early on in our life. If you've been in survival mode, you don't know that lesson. So all of our kids get a bicycle, and all of our facilities are in 10 or 12 minutes, and that's how they get around. So the typical day, 6 a.m., boys' house and girls' house, up some stretching, clean up, cook, prepare, and eat breakfast. 8 a.m., six days a week, English language class for two hours in our training session. Five-minute break, 10 a.m., culinary or hospitality class in our training session our training center, excuse me, or in our small teaching kitchen. 12 p.m., return to the house, clean up, prep, wash, cook, and eat lunch. Or, depending on your shift and schedule, apprentice lunch shift at the very now busy restaurant. 2 p.m., small group or individual English language tutoring, six days a week. 4 p.m., supervised study or computer language lab required five hours a week. 6 p.m., return to house, clean up, prepare, go to the market, cook dinner, unless you are scheduled for a dinner apprenticeship and then you're at the restaurant. 8 p.m., supervised study, phones off. Even very poor kids have phones. That's an interesting area I'll leave to somebody else to, just, to talk about. 8 p.m., supervised study, 10 p.m., bed, and they sleep well, as you can imagine, and the same thing the next day day in and day out for six days a week, and then for some seven days, if their shifts for apprenticing fall on a Sunday for lunch or dinner. It's not an easy program. 
but we're giving a lot and they're getting a lot and there's a lot of healing going on. And at the end of 18 month program, I'm proud to say, within 60 days, 100% of all of our kids have jobs, starting careers at international five-star hotels and resorts in the center of Vietnam. The Intercontinental, the Hyatt Regency, last year the Employee of the Year at the Hyatt Regency, I still get choked up over this, is a girl who I won't tell you a story, but her from the streets of Da Nang was the Employee of the Year at the Hyatt Regency. Um, and on and on and on, and that's where all our kids are at international resorts. Except I just lied a little bit. I have this discussion a lot with a close friend of mine about, are you allowed to lie when you tell stories? Is that the art of storytelling or are you still telling a lie? So I lied, but I'm telling you I told a lie. So now, now I'm going to set the record straight. I just said that within 60 days, 100% of all of our kids are at resorts and hotels and starting their, their careers. And by the way, within two years, making salaries equivalent to college-educated English teachers in Vietnam. Kids who never had enough to eat, kids who have been trafficked, kids who have been in orphanages, and on and on and on. But here, let me, let me set the record straight about this little lie I told in my story. Our restaurant has become so popular. We were number one in TripAdvisor for over two years, which we did purposely. My background is not as a philanthropist, it's as a man with a big heart, but I've been in the hotel and restaurant business all my, all my life. And I knew how important um, making the restaurant popular would be, certainly to our nature and our mission of being a social enterprise. We had to pay our bills. So we worked very hard to be number one on TripAdvisor, a bane of the current existence of those of us in the popular hospitality and industry. But our restaurant has become so popular that now we ask a number of our trainees in each graduating class when they finish, please stay and work for us. So now many of them do stay and work for us for six to nine months before they go on to the hotels. We give them an employment contract, the same as if they went to a hotel, we pay a little bit more than the hotels to kind of induce them, and we keep them around working for six to nine months as our, as our cooks and our chefs and as our servers and bartenders and our hosts and our hostesses. When we first started with my idea that all the kids should go to resorts and hotels, am I going too long? I, you, you know, if you don't know already, uh, although I live in Vietnam, I'm from New York, and I can really ramp it up and talk very, very quickly if you, if you want. Give me a few more minutes, and I'll, I'll talk fast. Okay. I thought it wasn't going to be long enough. That's always the... the um, anyway, when we first started, we had a lot of professionals working for us. We found that when our kids graduated, they're so much better prepared and so much better trained that they're better than any of the professionals we can hire. So that's why we keep them there. Um, give me a few minutes. This is important stuff. Um, we found when our kids were finishing that the kids in the front of the house, their English was really good. They had all this opportunity to practice English with the guests, largely English-speaking Westerners from from Australia, from the States, and Europeans who would speak English largely in the, in the restaurant. But the kids in the back of the house were finished, although they had the same um, classroom experience, uh, their English wasn't as good because they weren't practicing. They weren't having that opportunity to practice and as much build their confidence. No one was smiling at them except the teacher when they spoke English. So we tried to think of uh, some kind of way to teach back-of-the-house kids so their English was good. And we came up with this idea of trainee-led Market tours. Markets are very, very popular tourist thing. Our markets are beautiful and exotic and smelly and much different than most Westerners are used to. So we developed these trainee-led marking. Uh oh, now I'm getting both of them. I really better talk. <laughs> and I promise it was. It's really a long flight from Asia to be here. So we cre we created these uh, trainee-led market tours and a small tasting back at our restaurant. Revenue generating. Anybody want to guess last year how many guests? Trainee-led market tours we did. Somebody take a quick guess. Did I get angry at me? 150. Very close. We did 5,000 last year. Yeah, this is not just a street kid restaurant. That's why Ann asked me to come and talk about it. We just signed another contract. We created another experience of uh, noodle making. If you know uh, noodles are this amazing kind of, it's three parts water and two parts rice, and you mix it together, and you can make all kinds of noodles, depending on whether you steam it or sunbake it or fry it. Noodles are this very, very interesting, great, delicious food. We created this experience 
called Oodles of Noodles. We just signed a contract. We started in 2015 with a large door operator. Do you want to guess? Now we have 5,000 guests, trainee-led, not staff, trainee-led, orchestrated, rehearsed, planned, but an authentic experience. Trainee-led marketers, 5,000. Now we just signed and have started this Oodles of Noodles, noodle making and noodle tasting experience. Any, I'm proud of this, of course. Does anybody want to guess how many minimum noodle experience tours we're going to do? Not 150, not 5,000. Minimum of 10,000 guest visits for 2015. We have a real social enterprise going and we're helping kids in ways that nobody ever thought was possible. Healing brings us all here today and Anne our own healing and the healing of others. But I ask, can we ever be healed if a kid's belly is empty? Streets is about healing, about commitment, about self-sufficiency, about transformation. I ask all of you, if you haven't already, use your great resources as we talked about yesterday and today. Personally get involved, get your work involved, get your, your resorts involved, get your property involved, get your gut and your soul and your meditation involved, and figure out a way to help and to transform a poor kid. And if you can't figure out a way, I know all of you have the resources and the capabilities, come to us and help us at Streets. Thank you very, very much.